I initially thought I would do this one as like a live stream or something like that, but it looks like my computer is too old to do anything like that. So I'm just going to have to do the same technique that I normally do. I want to remind you of what we looked like back then. This is a photo taken in summer of 1984. Um, I'm barely 16 and he's well over 21. That's Mike and me. That was a photo taken with a camera set on a timer, so he took the photo. Mike's mother was Italian. Um, his mother's mother was Italian and his mother's father was Welsh and they lived in Minneapolis or in a suburb of Minneapolis. Oh, I've got that wrong. Mike's mother's parents were Italian. His grandmother was Italian and his grandfather is Welsh. Um, but my understanding was that the Welsh side of the family um, kind of shunned the family after um, his grandfather married his grandmother because the grandmother was Italian. So he had a lot of um, it Italian influence. His mother was very uh, influenced by Italian culture as opposed to Welsh because, you know, my assumption was it's because um, the Welsh side of the family had turned their back on them. Um, and I cannot remember, it sounds like the mother's maiden name, his mother's maiden name was Morgan, Welsh name Morgan. I don't know, I wish I knew what his maternal grandmother's maiden name was um, for various reasons, because um, anyway, I don't really know if Mike came into this through his father's line or his mother's line or both. But his stepfather, Phil, is, you know, the one that I met. I didn't know his real father, whose last name was Archer. Okay, so that's me and Mike in 1984. And then I just wanted to point out these contact sheets that Mike, you know, Mike would take photos and, and do his own developing and stuff back then. So, um, there, you know, there's these contact sheets with me on it, which I think is kind of imitated in this song, Raspberry Beret. Okay, so I just want to point that out. The reason is because sometimes people in music videos look like other people and there's a reason for it because they want to trigger memories. So a lot of this is a game about triggering <laughs> my memory. And a lot of the triggers, one of the ways that they trigger memories or thoughts or recognition is through people who look like other people. This music video opens with this sort of book scene. like it, It's like a book opening up. You can see the book opening up, and that's a theme that is imitated later on with that Tom Petty video for Into the Great Wide Open. It came out almost, it came out nine years after this video. This is 1985. This, this song came out in May of 85. So you open up this book and you get the scene, all these people dancing around, you know, in the band on these um, three pillars. And then these other characters, and then there's the band behind, you know, and other parts of the band, and then this dance floor. Kind of, you know, it reminds me a little bit of this sort of like um, First Avenue, what First Avenue was kind of like. First Avenue was a big dance club in Minneapolis. Um, close up of the feet and party scene. Then 16 seconds in, we get a view of Wendy playing guitar. Um, so that timing might be meaningful since 16 is the tower, which is destruction. And then you see the, the woman playing guitar. And then this guy back behind her, I believe is intended to look like Mike. And he's got this strange hexagram floating behind his head. At first I thought it was a stop sign or something. And I realized it's just this floating hexagram, not he yeah, hexagon. It's a floating hexagon. So it must signify something about this person's place. And I know that the hexagons and the pentagons are related shapes. The hexagons might be more related to the bees because it looks like a honeycomb. But um, that seems to be a weird thing in this video, and so therefore I think it matters. There's also these balloons. This was shortly after that Nana song, the German song Nana came out called 99 Luft, um, Air, 99 Luftballon, is it? Or 99 air balloons, red balloons. 99 red balloons, I think, is was the English translation. So when this video came out, I was living in Germany. 1985, May of 85, I was living in Germany. Um, I was 
just finishing school there and probably, you know, getting ready to leave Germany when this video came out. When I was living in Germany, Mike would come in and out. Mike actually traveled to Europe. You know, surprise, surprise, when I met him and I was about to go to Europe, surprise, surprise, he too was about to go to Europe. So, um, wow, what a, you know, what a coincidence. And so then he would come and hang out with me and then he would go travel. So now I'm seeing that this is a pattern of people that hang out with me. Um, back then, in particular. Um, but anyway, I was living in Germany when Mike wasn't in Germany and when he was in California, you know, back home, I remember getting, you know, I would correspond with people that I had been friends with and Michelle DiCostanzo was one of the people that I would correspond with. And I remember getting a letter from her where she talked about riding around in Mike's car and, you know, every once in a while his car would break down and he would do some sort of DIY repair on it. And I remember her telling me about that, um, you know, riding somewhere in my, with Mike's in his car and trying to repair the car as it broke down somewhere and everything like that. She used an emery board for some reason. I can remember she used a, a nail file for something. Um, I think I had that le letter for a long time. I don't think I have it anymore. So at some point in the early 90s, a bunch of my letters went missing. All the correspondence that I had with Mike went missing, other than maybe a couple things that were taped into my journals just all went missing and I think that letter also went missing and so it's interesting that this video the first time I tried to work on it was sabotaged as well um, it makes me think that there is something significant between Mike and Michelle that they have been trying to hide from me um, and at this point trust me I don't care if they had sex or any of that stuff you know it's way it's, it's like the least of my concerns at this point um, this woman hands Prince the guitar at the beginning of this video. This blonde woman. She looks a little like my friend Melinda. She could also look a little like my mom. You know, that type of person with this natural blonde, fair skin, all this kind of stuff. And I do think that she is intended to look a little like Melinda and possibly my mother. And the reason why she's handing Prince this guitar is because... Um, People are trading on these connections with us, and I think, you know, at some point I'm almost ready to get to the point where I can maybe, um, draw a picture of what the heck is even going on. Um, but, you know, the, Wendy here has this reddish hair, so at the time I was using henna in my hair, so my hair would be the same color, but then her hair is cut more like Michelle's hair would have been cut back then, so that's kind of interesting too. So the blonde woman hands Prince the guitar and he begins to rock. Oh, but not before we get a close-up of this drummer, who to me looks a lot like Mike. So you can draw your own conclusions as to whether I'm correct about that. Does he look a lot like Mike? Hell yeah, he looks a lot like Mike. Mike would often do that three-day growth thing or, you know, let his beard grow out a little bit and things like that. And he'd let his beard grow out or shave it and all this stuff. So, yeah, I think he looks a lot like Mike. And they focus on him. And then... They do this thing where they reproduce him, so it does in fact look like a, a contact sheet, kind of, but it's the same picture over and over, and what is it a picture of? It's this picture of his right hand raised up with his elbow out and a stick in the air, looking up to the right. So all of this is significant of being on the right side, and not only being on the right side, but being on the right side in a way where you're punishing the left, attacking the left with sticks, all this kind of stuff. This came out in May of 85 when I thought that we were so much in love. Like, we were just like the ultimate love story, right? The whole time, the dude was all about harming me. That was his whole entire purpose. I just... The depravity behind this just astounds me sometimes like I just I want to be speechless but I can't they spin him next okay so this is what people thought might happen and maybe it might have happened if my whole family hadn't been you know captured by this system complicit I'm not going to use Catherine Horton terminology anymore if I can help it but you know maybe if my whole family had not been complicit something good you know something could have happened but um it's pretty tough when 
under the circumstances that we're here. Now here we have, after this, okay, after he spins out, you see this woman spinning. She's dressed in gold, and she's got a white shirt on, and she's got this long hair. She, I believe, is intended to represent Native American woman. It's long before I met my daughter's father's family, but they were already, you know, waiting in the wings. Um, probably, you know, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say any specific person, but that's what I think she is there to represent. And you'll see this a lot in videos with, um, you know, black musicians and black um, dancers and things like that, because, you know, it makes more sense for a black person to emulate a Native American person than a white person. A white person does it; it becomes racist and weird. But um, you'll see it in these videos, you know, like the video for um, Black Street, No Diggity, and all that kind of stuff. These people imitating natives who are actually black. Okay, and so then I put this one in there. Let's see. Oh, because he's coughing. So he does this cough. So we, this guy is here. He spins. The Native American looking woman spins. And then Prince coughs with his right hand, kind of just saying, you know, this is a symbol of, you know, oh, she found out what's going on, and now she's, you know, taking you all to task, and, you know, um, the coughing is, you know, a symbol of, you know, difficulty breathing and things like that, of, you know. So, okay, so most people probably know that. I, of course, didn't know that because it was all kept from me. This one I just put in there because of the, you see the moon sort of, symbols in the clouds. So the reason why clouds are in here, I think, is because of this experience I had with Charlie DiCostanzo and I've talked about where he took us outside and told us to draw clouds and I realized that he probably in part knew that the clouds were affected, being affected by frequencies, perhaps, and he was trying to get me to actually look at the clouds. Um, and there's another thing I saw in this video that comes up later, which is um, the trees with the faces on them. It made me remember something that I had forgotten, which is that another thing that he had done was encourage us to see faces in tree trunks. And um, so Michelle lived like up this very wooded forested road. Um, if it was becoming evening time or something, I was walking to her house, which was about, you know, maybe a third of a mile from my house. Maybe not even that. Yeah, it was about a third of a mile from my house. Uh, it would get dark really fast because it was really kind of up in the woods. Um, and he kind of encouraged, he would do those things that would help me not be afraid of the woods by, you know, looking for faces in the trees and things like that. But not, not evil faces, just faces. Um, so you see faces and trees in this as well. So that's more confirmation that, yeah, this is about De Costanzo's. Um, from this angle, the drum kit kind of looks like an egg, a fried egg. Oh, here, here's the trees with faces. And then they come up again later. Then I just put this one up here because it's the hands in the air again. You know, it's at one, one, one typical thing that you see and you know now reminds me of that part of the Pink Floyd video where the river of blood has hands sticking up going underneath that bridge you know another thing too about the the name of this song um I had a you know berets were kind of cool back then I had a an, a forest green beret and I think Michelle DiCostanzo may have had a raspberry beret. I think I might have even noticed that when this video came out. But I can't remember for certain if that's the case. But if she didn't, she um, she colored her hair with something called a cellophane. It was a, um, so she had dark hair. M Michelle's, both Michelle's parents, I think, were Italian. And she had dark hair. She's, you know, olive skin, dark hair. And she would color her hair with a cellophane so in the sun it would gleam kind of raspberry and the color that she liked was called black raspberry. Um, let's see, that's, I'm noticing the hexagon behind the drummer here. Okay, and then these hooded figures here as he's doing this part of the song is kind of interesting. A black hooded figure on his left side and a white hooded figure on his right side behind each shoulder. 
This is where he says the phrase about going down to Old Man Johnson's farm. He uses a couple names in this song. One is um, Mr. McGee. I was working for Mr. McGee. That might be a reference, possibly. I mean, it's a it's a Scottish name, so the Scottish names come up a lot. I think possibly because of the Freemasonry, Scottish right. But then McGee, to me, triggers a memory of um, Bobby McGee, the song, the Janis Joplin song. And I think Bobby McGee in the Janis Joplin song is a police officer. I think Bobby is police officer. You know, Bob, Bobby, they're law enforcement, kind of black ops law, law enforcement. Bobby is, I think, the English, what English people call police officers. Bobby, me and Bobby McGee is about being surveilled by a police officer. It's about, you know, Chris and I, basically, and the kind of surveillance that we're under by a police officer. So this idea that, you know, Bobby shared the secrets of my soul because Bobby's spying on me. It's not because I wanted to share the secrets of my soul with this person, Bobby McGee. Anyway, not to get too far off on Bobby McGee, but, um... That's what Bobby McGee is about. So so in this song, he says he's working for Mr. McGee. So I think, you know, this is more reinforcement. I think the I in this song is intended to refer to Mike Payne. More confirmation that Mike Payne is actually directly linked up with law enforcement. So I've gotten lots of stuff in my dreams about Mike Payne being a killer. So what we're looking at is law enforcement killing people. Extrajudicially. including Mike Payne. Okay, so then we get this animated sequence and sort of the raspberry beret kind of becomes the sun. The sun gets wrapped up in these clouds with these, you know, kind of weird shapes. Mike and I talked a lot about paisley shapes and the idea of it being like the soul or a, he, he would call it a fish, but then the fish didn't have a tail and things like that. Um, and this seems to be sort of echoed in this. He made me a, a ring that had sort of two paisley shapes stuck together. Um, and you can see here, since, you know, Chris and I are the sun, between the two characters here, there's a sun. And um, although Mike himself doesn't have blue eyes, I think blue eyes is a, ref a reference to surveillance, especially surveillance that's linked to police department, you know, police law enforcement. I mean, police and FBI. Um, then, let's see. So there's this, you know, suggestion of romance between the two of them. This um, almost looks like an Easter egg, but this is sort of this, this is sort of a transition frame between the, you know, the beret and her head becomes the sun. And then you get these two singing together. Um, and he, it's, he's got this neat sort of, it's like this, you know, blue screen effect. And so that then his coat kind of disappears or changes colors because there's a blue screen and the clouds come out. It's pretty neat, actually. I like it. Okay, and so they're singing together. And I just think, you know, in some ways, Mike, especially when he let his hair grow out a little bit more and everything, you know, he, he this could look, you know, like Prince a little bit at times. And she could look a little like... Um, she at least has a haircut of Michelle. And then I noticed here, um, a lot of the dancers' legs are obscured in this blue screen thing, and it reminded me of that um, mural that's next to the police department on 47th and Burnside in Portland where the doctors appear to be standing inside of a solar panel. Their legs are buried in the solar panel. Kind of the same kind of thing, like as if you're walking in the ocean or something like that, or in the water. So it seems like it's similar to this reoccurring theme of people being in shallow water, wading around in shallow water that comes up again and again and again. Then, you know, here's this animated raindrop, but you can see that there's two moon shapes in it. Um, talks about the bar the rain falling on the barn um, roof, the sound of the rain on the barn roof. So there might there might be something specific that went on between um, Mike and Michelle that they're referring to. I wouldn't know because I wasn't there. However, um, my parents had a barn, and it's, you know very likely that there was surveillance devices in there as well. 
you know, they had a, um, a barn where the horses stayed, but I mean in the tack room next to the barn. So there's a little, you know, tack room where there were some saw horses where the saddles would go on and things like that. And then, you know, bridles and saddles would hang in there. And so, you know, and there was grain for the horses and things in there. Um, but I suspect something else, I suspect that there's something else going on as well. And oh, by the way, when he talks about old man Johnson and they kind of flip to that image, one of the guys kind of looks a little like Jerry Garcia. Well, I already know that Mike Payne had Grateful Dead links. Okay, let's keep going. So this line is, uh, I just write thunder because there's something about thunder here. Um, you know, another transitional frame, but you see this sort of weird double hand, not unlike a hand that I've drawn in my journal um, after seeing the Grateful Dead concert in Seattle. So I saw the Grateful Dead perform in Seattle in August of 1983, I think it was, or it might have been 82. Maybe it was 82. Anyway, so I, I traced my hand when I was writing about the Grateful Dead. And then the star. This is kind of interesting because Michelle used to decorate things with stars, and she drew stars like this, and I used to draw stars differently, and I, I changed the way I drew stars after seeing how she drew stars. It's kind of like hard to explain right here, but I'm just going to continue on. There's something else. Like, there's a heart sh in the in the heart-shaped box. There's a, um, some stuff imitating this, and I'm um, video. I'm going to talk about that later. Okay, um, I'm trying to get this finished before Chris gets back. So these are the designs on her dress that turn into designs that turns into real lightning and real stars and real moons and I think the reason for this is actually to explain about the stars so normally if you're drawing like a pentagram a star you know when you're taught to draw it when you're a kid you're taught to draw it with one line and you kind of you do like a triangle and you come up and you get you end up with like a in an a shape in the middle and she would draw just the outside of the star like that I learned to draw stars from watching Michelle draw stars in any case in this these are the stars and the moon that are on the woman's dress in the video and now they become real weather and I think that the reason for this is is to show that what other whatever kind of surveillance material that Michelle and Mike were collecting Later on, they would use it to create quote-unquote weather in the sense that um, they would try to portray things about me and then I would be affected, you know, my life would be affected based on what they were putting out about me. This um, sequence here is this rainbow sort of bubble that turns into a balloon and then this little person floats away in a balloon with clouds. I think this is a reference to these um, toys that we had back in the 70s. It's this um, sort of petroleum product that you would stick on the end of a straw and blow it and it would turn into this weird kind of bubble. I can't remember what they were called. I mean, we actually blew regular bubbles too. We'd play with real bubbles too. But um, and, and then I think bubble also refers to somebody who um, is going up to the top. You know, it's, I think it's similar to the stairs, something like that. So you're ri rising up, but yeah, so I think that's what that is. And the balloon is a, is a clue. So yeah, that, that shows him actually, that like actually illustrates that, the bubble rising up to the top and the person going with it. And then um, in this scene, you see behind Prince, and you never see it all the way, but you see that there's a flying heart behind him. A couple things about that. When I went and saw The Grateful Dead in, um, was it 82? Yeah, probably August of 82. I um, bought a bumper sticker, and one of the, on one side of the bumper sticker was a pyramid with lightning bolts, and on the other side of the bumper sticker was a flying heart. Um, but in addition to that, Chris ended up signing to this label called Flying Heart Records, which I think is what this really is about. So you can see the Flying Heart coming off of his right shoulder, okay? So Chris represents the left, just like me, and the right shoulder is the one that, you know, is keeping him restricted. So this is um, showing the Flying Heart Records was, you know, part of this effort to restrict Chris, even though they signed him to their label as if they were going to promote him and you know um, support him as an artist the whole purpose of this label was to bury him and um, this is a little clue about that now what people think 
what people were told, okay, because you see here the, the heart actually transforms into a sun. So the idea is the sun is going to burn off the clouds and the deception and the deceit and all of that and rise up. But that never happened because of a lot of other stuff happening, like, you know, Chris getting a bunch of drugs pushed on him, Chris getting a bunch of deception pushed on him, um, all the mind control stuff that was going on didn't happen. That's what I've been trying to do now, and it's, it's hellaciously difficult. Then it all kind of turns into rainbows, which is a symbol of sleep. But, um, you know, this is what I, I, I really believe, genu Prince genuinely believed that this was going to work. And um, it makes me really sad to hear his last concerts because I can tell that he was heartbroken by that point. Um, you know, I don't know if heartbroken is, is an exaggeration or not, but, you know, he's doing that last, listen to his last performance of Purple Rain, and when he says something, he changes the words to something like, it's such a shame this friendship never ends, or something like that, and he's talking about us being in captivity. That's a shame that it never freaking ends. So, I'm not sure which, what does that say? Wouldn't change, oh, this is just my question. What does this wouldn't change a stroke mean? Because I had a dream about Mike and brush strokes, and, you know, is this a sex reference? Is this about um, sex slash beating someone with a stick? Is this about um, painting? Is this about all of these things together? Probably. It's probably about sex and beating someone. Um, another picture showing the faces and the trees. This is this strange looking sort of um, globe with a, a mouth on it that becomes a microphone. It transforms into a microphone. So I think this is the idea of um, um, listening perhaps, to Chris and I, and then amplifying it in other ways. Um, this is just an image of a, um, you know, a cello or something like that, but it's this angle where it also looks like a hole and an edge, like a cliff that you could fall off and fall into the hole. And then this is also like a stick. Uh, illustration of the drummer. Let's see, what is he saying? Okay, and then it shows this embrace here. This, to me, is more confirmation that this is about Michelle DiCostanzo, and the reason is, is just these bright um, purple eyelids, which is exactly how she would wear her makeup. She had brown eyes, and I remember her wearing purple eyeliner, purple eyeshadow, and things like that. So that's it. Um, so yeah, this is about Mike Payne and Michelle DiCostanzo. So obviously they were connected through me um, as far as all of the spying goes. Were they romantically connected? Probably, maybe. I, she acted like she had had a crush on him. I didn't know if that was maybe just a game that she was playing to. I mean, now when I think about it, it could have been a game to make him seem more attractive to me. Um, or it could have been they really were romantically involved. And once again, I don't care at this point. This would be far from the worst thing that Mike did to me. But, um, you know, the other interesting thing about this, you know, guitar player Wendy being centered is that um, Mike ended up marrying a woman named Wendy. And this name Wendy keeps coming up even before he married her. I don't know if that's just a coincidence or maybe it's mind control or maybe is it possible he had a pre-existing relationship way, that went way back with this woman, Wendy. That's totally possible, too. I mean, I don't know how he met her. But um, that song, that's that song. It's about um, Mike and Michelle. And by the way, the song, the movie Love Story, I believe, is also about Mike and Michelle. And that came out in 1971 when Michelle would have been, you know, a toddler. So that's how, that's, the, these, they were born into it. And their their relationship, they were always going to have some type of connection that was planned out well ahead of time. <laughs>